Hey, Peg. Hey, sis. What you doing? Um, uh, not much. Hey, well, um, I'm not doing much either because Paul, he left for church just a little bit ago, and um, he's got a um, he's got the meeting that the planning meeting, and then after that he's got the council meeting. And Elena, she's off studying at a friend's house, so I'm all by myself now, too. Hey, you want to come over and watch a Hallmark movie? <laughs> oh, I'd love to, but I'm looking at a mountain of laundry, and it won't be getting done by itself. Oh, well, I was hoping to have a couple of minutes to talk to you about the Good Friday service. Ask me now. The towels will wait a little longer, hopefully. <laughs> well, what do you think of the pastor's idea to start out the service by washing our feet? Sounds okay to me. I mean, Jesus did it for his disciples. It could be a very meaningful service. Really? It sounds really weird to me. Like strange. Jesus did it because they got their feet dirty back then while they were traveling. And so he washed his feet, disciples' feet, because there weren't any um, servants around. He was showing humility and service. So why shouldn't the pastor do it? Well, it is so not necessary as it was back then. Our feet don't get dirty like that. So what's the point? I mean, it's not pastorly. <laughs> if service was the point, let the deacons do it. Uh, since when do we have deacons? Oh. All right, well, let the greeters do it. <laughs> but not the pastor. It's just not his job to be humble. He serves in a more spiritual way, and, and it's just, um, well, I just, I just can't wrap my mind around it. <laughs> um, I, the problem is not with the pastor. It's your pride. That's your problem. <laughs> well, you're right. I sure wouldn't want to wash everyone's feet. <laughs> uh, now it's your vanity and pride. You don't like for people to look at your feet. You got that right, sister. I inherited the world's ugliest feet from Dad. I mean, I could leave platypus prints in the sand. <laughs> Honey, I hate to agree with you, but you surely do have the ugliest big toes. <laughs> they look like light bulbs. If Edison had seen them, he would have had no trouble designing those light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right about that. Well, I sure hope you're not thinking about skipping the service just because of the foot issue. Nah, I'm coming, but, you know, maybe I'll come in the side door. <laughs> hey, I'll call you back later. I don't want to miss the beginning of the movie. Okay, I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Oh, it's been a long day. I was this tired. I think I'll just close my eyes during the commercials, like. <sighs> hey, Peter. We're going to go over to the Mount of Olives. You ready? Uh, Peter. Simon Peter. Hello. You know, uh, I have to finish up a couple of things. You guys go on without me. It's nothing. I'd just rather not go. You're not still upset about the whole washing the feet thing, are you? I mean, I can tell something's bothering you. Oh, yes. It's this foot washing thing. Why was that so important to you? Well, you know it's customary to wash the guests' feet when they come into the house. There weren't any servants around when we got here. Somebody had to do it. Why not me? 
but just because there weren't any servants, that didn't obligate you to wash our feet. You could have called anyone off the street or said to one of us, find someone. But you, well, you know, it just wasn't right. For all that matters, we could have just reclined with dirty feet. <laughs> oh, that's a gruesome thought. But go on. Why is having me wash your feet so bad? Two reasons. One, it's unseemingly, you know, totally inappropriate for your position. Which is? Which is what? My position? The Messiah, the King. You can't be on your knees washing feet. It's not the way to be a ruler. Kings and messiahs don't do that. And what would you say is the way a messiah should act? Strong, powerful, in control of everything. You could have shouted out the door, hey, need a servant over here, and 20 people would have come running. <laughs> People need to know that you have the power to keep the kingdom safe and will keep it safe. Which kingdom is that? The Messiah's kingdom. Yours. Look, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You've been sent to reestablish the kingdom. Well, it's time. The signs are all there. I mean... I saw Elijah and Moses with my own eyes. I knew right then and there what it meant. Your kingdom is at hand. Even in the next few days, you might be crowned king of the Jews. And you can take your rightful place as the Messiah who will restore Israel. Just like a few days ago, you rode into Jerusalem to a whole crowd of people cheering, cheering you on. Everyone is excited now. We're all on your side. Well, the truth is a lot of people were not cheering for me. Well then, start acting like a king now and get their respect. You have to know there's going to be a doozy of a power struggle with Herod and Pilate and Oh, the Sanhedrin and, you know, the priests and the Pharisees. It's going to be a mess, and you've got to use the power of God that he has given you. Heaven help us, Jesus. You can't be acting like a servant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was your second reason? I mean, I just don't get it. Maybe everybody else does, but not me. I thought I had it all figured out, but nothing seems to be working. Nothing's working out like it's supposed to. And I can't make sense of the things you've been saying lately. It's like you're saying you are the Messiah, but you don't act like it. Specifically? The things like... You have to be killed and dying, but coming back. And I can't come with you. You're going, but later I can. And today you said, I couldn't be a part of you unless I let you wash my feet. That's humiliating, you know. <laughs> Maybe. I made a mistake by dropping everything and coming with you. Okay, so you're humiliated and you're doubting. Is that the second thing? It is. You humiliated me so much. When, when you said that I would deny you, how can you say that? I've been with you for three years. And now, but maybe, maybe right, maybe I'm not really a part of whatever plan you have for being the Messiah. Just so you know, Peter, you aren't the only one who doesn't get it. But you're one of the few who isn't afraid to say so. I do appreciate that kind of honesty. Oh. Well, I do feel 
Like I'm being put down by the other guys too. So when you say something, not a part of you, I feel I'm sticking my foot in my mouth. Maybe I should just go away. I mean, from day one, I've been with you. Seeing the miracles, hearing you teaching lessons to the Pharisees like no one else could. We've been through so much, and, and this is what I get. You saying, I would deny you? How can you say that? In the comment today, do you have a clue how that makes me feel? I know you've been questioning a lot of things lately. Yeah, that's right. You know what the biggest problem is. You aren't using your God-given power. Which power, Peter? All of it. You have power over everything. The wind, over the rain, over the water, over demons, diseases, and even over death. God-given power. And here you are, washing our feet. Jesus, why? Why are you washing our feet? Jesus, why? Why are you wasting your time? Why don't you use your power to bring on a new kingdom? The heck with controlling the storms. Use your power to control the Romans. Do away with them and their corrupt rulers and the, and the priests. How can you restore the kingdom if you're running around washing feet? Who cares about that? I do understand your logic, but it's worldly logic. And my kingdom is not of this world. Not of this world? Here we go again. Talking in riddles. What do you mean? Not of this world. Where do you think Israel is? On the moon? So Jesus, why are you here? If you're not going to restore Israel to where it's supposed to be, then what are you doing? Kingdoms established and with earthly power will come and go. Even David's rule once he passed away fell apart. So even if Israel was restored to power now, once we're gone, there's nothing to stop it from happening again. Even Rome won't hold on to power much longer. But my kingdom eternal. My Heavenly Father has created it, and it will never be overcome by anything. But surely, a kingdom without a king will dissolve into chaos. My Heavenly Father is sovereign in our kingdom. And yes, you're right. He has given me authority over the rain and the water and the demons and diseases and over the moon and stars as well. But these are things they're just things. They don't have a heart. And that's why we care about your heart and your well-being. You were so loved by the Father and by me, I might add. Jesus, I love you too. And he wants you to love and enjoy being with him forever. <laughs> and you enjoy being with him forever. He sent me to show you this truth. God's kingdom is about righteousness and justice. It's about shalom for everyone. Not just the rich and powerful, not just the bold and beautiful, but for slaves, for the lowly, for the tax collectors, for the unloved, for the shepherds, the artisans, and even the fishermen, for Samaritans, for saints and sinners, Peter, even for the Gentiles. Jesus, how do I get into this kingdom? Trust me, 
and follow me. I'll show you. The kingdom is about service and humility, not pride and power and favoritism. It's about loving God and treating each other with love, taking care of each other. No task is too menial for me or for anyone else in the kingdom. No task is so important it's reserved for a select few. I never thought of it like that. It's okay, Peter. We all agree that we should serve God. We serve Him best by serving each other. We put the neediest needs before our own. And when we are needy, we let others serve us. But Jesus, I didn't really need to have my feet washed today. <laughs> Truth is, Peter, that we're all needy at times. My Heavenly Father sent me here to show you this truth and the way to His kingdom, the way to eternal life. I am my Father's servant, and by serving Him, I'm serving you. And the other way around, too. If you serve me, you are serving my Father. And when I'm gone, Lord, no. Yes, I'll go where you can't follow. But that's it first. Soon afterward, you will follow me. By tomorrow night, you'll know what I mean, I promise. But when I'm gone, you will still serve the Father by serving each other, as if you were serving me. Does that make any sense to you? Well, some of it. I'm sorry for being so thick-headed. I do want to serve you, but it's so hard to think of you as a servant, and that's really hard for me. I need to think of myself as needy, too. I get so confused sometimes about what I should be doing. Please forgive me. Help me to understand the things you're talking about. Done. So you ready to go to Mount of Olives now? You've got it. You don't need that sword tonight. You don't know what I might need it for a snake. Peter. You need to know that I would stand on the snake barefooted before I'd allow it to kill you. You would die to save me? That's why I'm here. After all, I, after all I've said and done, Lord, why? Because we love you. And, you and God? I'm so sorry. I've been so angry and frustrated. I was going to leave the group. Please forgive me. Lord, I want to serve you tonight. What do you need the most right now? I really need you guys to pray with me tonight. You got it, Lord. I'll tell the guys we're ready to leave. I thank you, Peter. You brought me so much joy. You mean so much to me. My life here is better because of him. His heart is pure and he truly yearns for righteousness. He is so eager to obey and to please you. I agonize so much for him. I know soon he'll suffer. He'll suffer the greatest failure and humiliation in his life. Father, the work you sent me to do is finished. And I won't be there to be able to help him through this great despair and grief. But Lord, I command you, Peter, for your care, for you to guard him, especially from himself. Satan tries to tempt him and following Judah's footsteps. In the midst of the terror, please remind him that I have already forgiven him. Father, I, I pray for those who have trusted in me. As the darkness descends into evil and chaos, give them strength. Give them hope even though they know what to hope for. 
They'll turn to me. It's always, I, Lord, Judas isn't back yet. Should we wait? That's okay, Peter. You'll be there. You'll be there. You'll be there. You'll be there. Dear God, I am just as thick-headed as Peter was. I've been in this church all these years and never paid much attention to a lot of things, I guess. Please forgive my shallowness and my pride. Help me to be a good servant. And don't let me be too proud to let others help me. Your son was the ultimate servant. And by serving you, he saved me. Help me to remember this the next time my pride starts kicking in. I really need to do this. Good Friday is the night which we remember all that Jesus did for us. This is the night in which we remember his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. So out of reverence, I want to ask as you leave this place, you do so in silence. And for anyone who would like to have their feet washed, Pastor Gary and I will be here would be honored to do so. Good night.